Well, hello, good to meet you. My name is Sandra. Our manager asked me to go through the basic people skills information that's part of your MDP. I'm glad to do it. I was in your shoes as a new manager, and I know what it feels like. I sure have learned a lot about operations and working with people since I started. I brought my copy of the Transitions to Management workbook that you'll need during our time together. If you don't have your copy, go ahead and stop the video and get it now. While you watch this video, follow along in your workbook and use it as a place to take notes. Sometimes the information I talk about is included in the workbook. This icon will flash on the screen, prompting you to look at the next page in your materials. At certain times, I will ask you to pause the video and complete exercises in the workbook. Once the trust and respect section is completed, you'll be asked to stop the video and practice what you've learned on a few shifts and meet with your coach. Hopefully, you've scheduled meeting times together. If not, please do that at the first break. Billy and Maria, two new shift managers are working today and they just completed the shift management training. They're both doing well, but like all of us, they still have things to learn. I thought it would be helpful for you to observe them in action and learn from their experience. Billy and Maria both said they're happy to help, and it's a great opportunity for them to get feedback on how they're doing. Okay, let's get started. McDonald's has identified management skills that are important for all managers. These McDonald's management skills are 1. Building trust and earning respect 2. Communication 3. Cooperation 4. Coordination 5. Customer service and 6. Decision making We'll be focusing on the first two skills, building trust and earning respect and communication. Why do you think this list starts with a focus on people skills? You've got it. These skills are important because our people drive the results of our restaurant. Can you imagine starting a shift without your crew? It would be a rough day, wouldn't it? The McDonald's People Promise states, we value you, your growth, and your contributions. The People Promise is a commitment to our employees that we strive to achieve with our actions every day. It's how we remind our employees what they can expect and how high our goal is to be the best employer in each community around the world. We need to make sure this promise rings true in all we do as managers. Oh, uh, sorry to interrupt you. <laughs> Hi, Billy. No problem. What's up? I just want to let you know I finished my shift and Maria's going to take over. All right. Great. Thanks for all your work, Billy. I'll check in with Maria in a few minutes. Sounds good. I'll let her know. People interactions are the most challenging part of this job, but they're also the most rewarding. Each person's experience is a little different, depending on whether they've been promoted from crew or not. Me? I was promoted from crew. Suddenly, I was managing people that the week before I was crew with. Now that's awkward. It took me a while to feel comfortable in my new role. I wanted to establish myself as a leader. I knew bossing people around wasn't going to work, so for a while, I avoided difficult situations because I didn't want to offend anyone. That didn't work either. Our store manager reminded me that leaders inspire people to do their work by treating their crew with respect and working hard themselves. If the crew is satisfied with their jobs, then they perform better. If they perform better, then QSE is delivered. If QSE is delivered, then customers are satisfied. So, what do you think your crew wants from their management team? While I'm checking in with Maria, write some thoughts in your workbook. Looks like Maria's all set. How did your exercise go? Some of the things you might have included are giving breaks on time, recognizing crew efforts, and providing a safe, comfortable working environment. You'll have a chance to talk with your crew about their wants during one of your exercises at the end of this section.
It's always best to hear directly from your own crew about what they want and need for management. One more thought here. McDonald's has discovered the number one reason crew quit their jobs is conflict with management and lack of respect. This demonstrates how crucial it is to have effective people skills and to build trust and respect with our crew. Most of us are influenced by the people that we spend the most time with, especially those we look up to. This might include parents, friends, a teacher, or even a manager at work. Me? I had an incredible coach when I played high school basketball. She expected a lot from our team, but she always lived consistently by her rules. She expected us to be on time for practice and games, and she was always on time. When she said we had to be physically prepared, she'd run laps with us. And something I really appreciated, she always did what she said she'd do, whether it was coming to practice early to help us or writing a letter of recommendation for me when I was looking for a job. McDonald's calls this influence the shadow of a leader. All the things that you think, say, and most of all, do cast a shadow on the people around you. This shadow influences the way people see you, interact with you, and learn from you. My basketball coach cast a shadow that had a very positive influence and helped me to be my best. And now, I often do things like she did. Before we continue, spend a few minutes thinking about your own experiences with trust and respect and the shadow that others have cast in your life. Record your thoughts in your workbook. So, what did you discover about trust and respect? Are the actions of those you trust similar to those you respect? Often these two are heavily intertwined. We trust those we respect and vice versa. In fact, McDonald's uses the formula trust times respect equals influence. The more trust and respect you earn from your crew, the greater your influence on their performance. And the more trust and respect you earn, the more you cast a positive shadow on your crew. Trust and respect take time to develop, but they are easy to lose. For this reason, we must constantly be thinking about the shadow we are creating. Building trust is pretty easy to understand, but can be hard to do. To help, we've come up with seven ways to build trust and respect with your crew. If you focus on these items, a positive shadow will naturally develop. Some items will come to you quickly, and others will take extra attention and practice. The first strategy for building trust is to keep your commitments. Did this show up on your description of people you trust or respect? It's probably the most important item. Just as I mentioned with my basketball coach, we all want to know that someone will do what he or she says they'll do. What if your manager said you'd be starting the shift management training but kept moving the start date? Or offered you a specific day off but then changed the schedule at the last minute? It'd be difficult to trust what your manager was saying, wouldn't it? It's common sense, really, but so important. Take a look at Billy's experience with one of our experienced crew. Hi, Billy. I hope I'm not interrupting. You wanted to see me? Yeah, uh, come on in, Alex. Have a seat. I know how anxious you are to become a crew trainer, and I promised we would start your training soon, so how about starting next week? Oh. You still feel ready for this? Yes, definitely. Thanks for remembering and getting me set up so quickly. Uh, at my last job, they always promised to promote, but they never did. This means a lot to me. Oh, no problem. So we'll be working together throughout the training. Alex told me he was very excited to get his materials. He's been working hard, and Billy knew that. Billy promised to get him into crew training soon and wanted Alex to know he would follow through on his commitment. Billy also knows our store manager is committed to people development and has made a point to follow her example. The next way to build trust is to act in others' best interests. The crew needs to know that you are committed to providing a good working environment and that you will do what you can to help them perform better and resolve issues. Okay, bye. Billy, uh, it's near the end of my shift and I was hoping to leave early. I just got a call from my wife. My daughter Carrie is very sick. I'm worried, and I was hoping that someone could take over for me right away. Oh, I'm sorry to hear about Carrie. 
I'm sure I can make some positioning changes and we can cover for you. Oh, thanks, Billy. I really appreciate this. Not a problem. I hope Carrie's feeling better soon. Keep me posted. Okay, thanks. Great. Billy said he was thinking of how his managers would have handled that same situation with him. It keeps him focused on what's important for the business and for our people. The third element for building trust and respect is being open and friendly with your crew. This one can be tricky. It's hard to fully trust people if you don't know anything about them, so it's good to share a little about yourself. At the same time, it's important to avoid getting too personal. There are details about a manager's role and other topics of conversation that aren't appropriate for the workplace. Let's look at an example with Maria, our other new manager. Like me, Maria was promoted from crew. Hey, Tina. Hey. Your order taker on drive through today. Okay, cool. So how's it going? How was your trip? Great. We had a great time. But I didn't have fun when I got back to work yesterday. The new guy on grill just could not keep up. I mean, a couple of us were talking about how he should be more experienced coming from another restaurant, but he just didn't do well. I hope he's not getting paid the same as Alex or me, is he? I'm sorry it was a rough day. I think you're talking about Jose. He told Billy yesterday he was a little overwhelmed. I'm sure he'll get the hang of things in the next couple of days. Until then, Alex has offered to help him on his shifts. Okay, but what about his pay? That's something I can't discuss. What each person makes is confidential. I know you wouldn't want me sharing information of yours with others. I have to give everybody the same privacy. I guess so. Don't worry about Jose. We'll work with him. He'll be up and running in the next couple of days. Thanks. Mm -hmm. I was friends with a lot of the crew before becoming a manager, so I had a few of these awkward conversations until the crew understood the boundaries. I was consistent in my responses and have continued to be very friendly. I really enjoy talking to the crew, but I also know I have to draw the line on some topics. If you ever have a question about this, talk with your manager. So think about this. You come out of work and discover that your car won't start. You're pretty sure it's your battery. Two of your friends in the restaurant offer to jumpstart the car for you. As you pull out your jumper cables, one friend says, I haven't actually jumpstarted a car before, but I've watched my brother, so I'm pretty sure I can do it. The second person shows you the negative and positive wires and where he's going to position them on the battery. He also tells you what he will do to properly ground the connections to avoid damage to your car. Which person do you want to help you through the process? I'm guessing you'd either let the second person jumpstart your car or call a tow truck service, since you know they have experience. The same idea applies to our work here at McDonald's. For the crew to trust and respect your direction, they need to see that you know what you're doing and are keeping up with McDonald's standards. This means knowing operating procedures such as times, temperatures, and targets, knowing how to manage the crew and other aspects of the job. Just this afternoon, I noticed Billy helping a new crew person as he was finishing his pre-shift checklist. Thank you. Your total is 329 out of five. Hi, Mary. Looks like these fries are a little overcooked. I thought so, too. I was just going to ask someone. Oh, no problem. First, uh, let's throw these out so we don't serve overcooked fries to the customer. I'll have a There we go. Now, let's see what's wrong and get more fries cooking. Uh, which fat did you use? The middle one. Okay. Ah, looks like the setting on the fryer is incorrect. Uh, my guess is someone forgot to change the product selection after breakfast. Our hash browns cook at a higher temperature. At this setting, our fries tend to get too crisp. So, uh, let's change the setting to fries. There we go. And. Cover the vat so no one uses it yet. Now I'll come back in a few minutes to give the, the oil some time to cool and uh, we can make a batch together. This way we'll be sure everything's working correctly. Oh, sounds good. Great. Billy knew what was wrong and knew how to fix it. As a new crew person, I'm sure this gave Mary some confidence about her manager's concern for quality and his ability to fix a problem. Along with demonstrating competence, you need to show that you are confident in your own abilities. How do you do this? 
One way is to be comfortable making decisions and not second-guessing yourself. At the same time, you want to lead the crew without seeming arrogant. No one likes a know-it-all. If you're not sure how to proceed, it's okay to ask others for their thoughts. Showing confidence is one of the strategies that takes time to master. You probably won't be completely comfortable in your role for a while. That's okay, because you're learning. Maria's recent experience is a good example. Your total is 341, please. Yep. I got a five. A bus? And it's full of kids. Hey, Maria, I just saw a bus in the parking lot and it's full of kids. Thank you for telling me. Oh, we could really use the sales. Jose, drop two baskets now. Thanks. Christian, there's a bus in the parking lot. Can you change your cabinet levels to medium volume and make sure everyone's in position? Thanks. Jose, can you talk to the driver and see if they're having meals or just desserts? I'll cover for you while you're gone. Thanks. Okay, everyone, let's show them what we got. Got it. This was one of the first times Maria had a bus arrive during her shift, but she handled it well. She may have been nervous, but it didn't show. She did a nice job directing the crew to their most productive locations and appeared logical and calm through it all. Another key way to build respect and trust is to present a professional image. This means looking neat and clean in appearance, but also involves respecting the position by showing up on time and keeping a calm demeanor with crew and customers. What if Billy's first day as shift manager had started like this? Thank you. Come again. Hi, everyone. Sorry I'm late. I was out partying late last night. I couldn't seem to drag myself out of bed. You know how it goes. Anyway, uh, Jose, I know I said we would get you started on drive through today, but I don't think we're going to have enough time to go through everything. Why don't you just stay on fries for now, and we'll talk about it later, OK? I'm already behind schedule. Yeah, OK, Billy. So did Billy present a professional image? Not at all. He looked messy in his appearance. Billy didn't seem to take his role seriously, showing up late after a long night out. It's difficult to get any respect or have any influence on your crew if they can't take you seriously. Fortunately, that's not the way he really is. Let's look at a better example. Thanks. Come back soon. I'll have a six-piece nugget with barbecue sauce. Hi, Tina. Oh, Jose, you're both here. Excellent. I just finished my pre-shift planning, so I'm ready to get you guys started. Tina, I think you know you're unregistered, too. Jose, we're going to get you started on drive through today, since you've been through the training. I'd like to talk through the process with you one more time, just to make sure you're comfortable. Then we'll let you try it. Sound good? Yes, it does. I'm looking forward to doing something different. By the way, I heard Sandra say we're doing a new promotion. Is that something I need to learn today? Well, I don't know the details of the promotion yet, since it doesn't start till next week. But Sandra's going to meet with all the managers tomorrow, and we'll let you and the others know in plenty of time. OK. Great. Much better, isn't it? That's the Billy we know. What did he do to present a professional image? Billy was neat and clean in his appearance. He was on time, ready to give the crew their direction for the day. Did you also notice that he wasn't acting like a know-it-all? Billy was comfortable letting Jose know he didn't have an immediate answer to his question. We're on to our last strategy for building trust and earning respect. Use respectful communication. If someone treats you well, it's easy to do the same in return, isn't it? So if we want our crew to respect us, we need to treat them with respect. Some of the things we need to focus on are being courteous, using a pleasant tone of voice, and keeping calm even in difficult situations. These are all part of our communication style, which is vital for building trust and earning respect, and for all aspects of management. We will be focusing on communication in the next section. Let's address the details for how to communicate at that time, but remember that respectful communication is critical. To practice the strategies for building trust and earning respect, let's take a look at Maria interacting with her crew. In your workbook, turn to the Building Trust and Earning Respect Observation Checklist. This checklist includes all of the strategies and behaviors we've discussed. Observe Maria's actions in this scenario. At the end of the scenario, stop the video. 
then check yes or no to the strategies that Maria demonstrated and note any observations. Tina, please check the cups and bags and restock them if needed. When you're finished, you can take a break. Got it. Thank you. Jose, please set up the fry station for lunch. I'll be checking the shake machine. Okay. Thank you. Wow, look at you. <laughs> Promoted and doing manager stuff now. I bet you have a lot to learn. I do. Most of the preventive maintenance stuff is easy, but it's the other stuff that gets a little bit more difficult. Yeah, like what? Like being a better leader. Keeping you guys happy and productive. I like to hear that. <laughs> and speaking of things I heard, did you hear about Tom? No. Last week, my friend and I were at the mall, and we saw him buying jewelry. And I hear his girlfriend is much older than him. I heard that about her, too. You think he's getting ready to propose? <gasps> Wouldn't that be something? You know what? I'll ask Alex tomorrow. He always knows the scoop. Tell me what he says. You know what? The lunch rush is going to start soon. I need you back at your register right away. What about my break? <sighs> so, what did you think? Let's review the relevant points from our checklist. Keeping her commitment. Maria promised Tina her break and then changed at the last minute. This obviously didn't go over well, so I'd mark that as a no. Acting in others' best interests and being open but not too personal. If he heard Maria and Tina's conversation, how do you think he would react? Gossiping about the crew creates a negative shadow that ripples through everything we do. Demonstrate competence and confidence. From what we saw, Maria seemed to have a handle on the technical aspects and appeared fairly confident. Presenting a professional image. Maria has a clean and neat appearance, but still, she wouldn't appear professional to anyone who heard her conversation. Respectful in communications. She said everything in a calm tone and used please and thank you but some of her comments were clearly not respectful. Isn't it amazing how one part of our actions can affect so many areas? Let's take a look again and see how Maria really handled this situation. Tina, please check the cups and bags and restock them if needed. When you're finished, you can take a break. Got it. Thank you. Jose, please set up the fry station for lunch. I'll be checking the shake machine. Okay. Thank you. Wow, look at you. Promoted and doing manager stuff now. I bet you have a lot to learn. I do. Most of the preventive maintenance stuff is easy, but it's the rest of it that's kind of difficult. Yeah? Like what? Like being a better leader. Keeping you guys happy and productive. I like to hear that. <laughs> and speaking of things I heard, did you hear about Tom? No. Last week, my friend and I were at the mall, and we saw him buying jewelry. And I hear his girlfriend is much older than him. I heard that about her, too. <laughs> but I'd rather not hear the details. As Tom's shift manager, I don't want him to think I'm talking about him. You understand. Hmm, OK. You know what? Lunch rush is going to start soon, and I promised you a break, so why don't you take that right away? Thanks. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Quite a difference, isn't it? You probably gave Maria good ratings in all areas, keeping her commitment with Tina's break, acting in others' best interest, being open but not too personal, 
being professional in both her appearance and actions, and this time being very respectful in her communication. It was a difficult thing she did, stopping the gossip with her friend from work. Hopefully, Tina will understand and recognize that Maria will treat her and all others on the crew with the same respect. Maria has her priorities straight. Speaking of communication, I need to check with Maria on this afternoon's shift. We've covered quite a bit so far. Seems like a good time for a break. While I hope our conversation has given you some good information, practicing these skills on the job is going to be the biggest impact. We've outlined some exercises to do during your upcoming shifts and some activities to be done with your coach. These should be completed before we move on to communication. All of the exercises and activities are listed in your workbook. Remember, this is a great time to practice everything without too much pressure. Everyone knows that you're learning. When you've finished, come back and see me for the rest of basic people skills. Welcome back to the basic people skills training. While you were gone, Maria did an excellent job managing her shifts. She's getting better every day. Hopefully, you practiced the strategies for building trust and respect that we talked about in the first part of this training and met with your coach. Continue to keep the lines of communication open between you and the crew and between you and your coach. You'll find these relationships help you throughout your career. The next part of our training focuses on communication the second of McDonald's management skills. Don't forget that the icon flashing on your screen will tell you when information is also included in your workbook. So, what is communication? It's a process we use to exchange information and ideas. Whether through talking, writing, sign language, or any other ways, communication allows us to express ourselves and send a message to others. Communicating effectively with your crew is probably the most important skill you can develop. There are six elements to effective communication. They are, one, choosing the appropriate leadership style. Two, using the concept, be here now. Three, be courteous. Four, present a clear message. Five, check understanding. And six, give appreciative and constructive feedback. Let's start with the first one, choosing the appropriate leadership style. There are two leadership styles to consider. The first is called the directive leadership style. Just as the title implies, you are being directive in your approach. You typically make a decision and tell the crew what needs to happen. This style is best when you're concerned about safety when the task or decision is urgent, and when you need things done a specific way, such as a new procedure or store promotion. You will tend to use directive style with less experienced employees. Let's take a look at an example of the directive style. Jose, I see you're filtering without your protective gear. Please stop, I need you to get your gear immediately. Oh yeah, I forgot. I don't want you to get hurt. It only takes one slip-up to have a disaster. Yeah, you're right. In this case, Billy chose to be directive because Jose's safety was compromised. You may have noticed Billy was directive, but still courteous. The second style is called the participative style of leadership. Just like the title says, you ask for participation in the process. You might say, here's our goal. How do you think we should make this happen? This is a good style to use when safety is not an issue, the task or decision is not urgent, and you want ideas or help in the process. You typically use this style with experienced employees. Let's look at an example of this leadership style. Alex, Tina, thanks for joining me. Uh, I think you both know that the managers and I really appreciate your work. You're always on time. You're always wearing the correct McDonald's uniform. You follow proper procedure. And you both seem to really enjoy working here. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Billy. Yeah, I do enjoy working here. Well, and that's good to hear. Now, I was hoping to get input from both of you. 
As you know, uh, the busy season is fast approaching and we need to hire more people. Unfortunately, we don't have nearly enough applications. <laughs> what we need is more people like you. I was wondering, since you both lived in the area for a while, if you might have any ideas on how we can recruit more good people. Would you be interested in helping out? Sure, I have a few ideas. Definitely, me too. Great, well, thanks for your help. Uh, let's get started right away. In this case, Billy didn't need to take immediate action, and there was no concern about safety. Even more important, he knew Alex and Tina would have some great ideas, so he wanted to involve them in the process. Let's take a look at some scenarios in your workbook and decide which leadership style is best, participative or directive. I'd also like you to think about your own experience and see what you can apply with your crew. Okay, let's consider your responses. In the first scenario, you're explaining to the drive through and front counter crew people how to handle the new discount coupons. What style do you use? Yes, directive. Assuming this promotion is new, the crew needs specific information about how the promotion works. You or another manager are the source of information about how things work. You do not need input from the team. What about scenario two? where you have four experienced crew on the breakfast shift. You need to identify ways to improve customer service at breakfast by improving QSC. This is a good opportunity to use a participative style. Your crew is experienced and works with the customer on a regular basis. They know better than anyone what people are looking for. Involving the crew in the discussion increases their interest in achieving the customer satisfaction goal. In scenario three, you see a crew person mopping the lobby without putting out a wet floor sign. What leadership style do you use? This scenario is similar to the one we saw with Jose and the Friar. You don't want anyone to get hurt slipping on a wet floor. Since the sign needs to be put out immediately, the best style to use is directive. In this last scenario, your experienced drive through team is assembling orders in the wrong sequence. Did you have difficulty deciding what to do? Using a directive style would be best. Although the crew is experienced, which is often a good time to use the participative style, in this case, you need to be directive. It's important for the crew to follow procedures in order to ensure QSC. In participative leadership, you are encouraging others to work with you. This can be a difficult step for new managers. A common mistake is to do too much on their own instead of relying on the crew for help. Effective managers know how to inspire others to work with them. Why? Because they know they can't do it all themselves. Delegating or giving someone else the responsibility for a job or task is a key skill to develop. Let's look at an example of delegating. Billy noticed that the drive through times were slow, so he started to bag orders. Billy's uncomfortable asking the other crew for help. Since he knows he is very fast at running for drive through he spends a lot of his shift helping here. As he is working with the drive through crew, who is at the observation post checking overall progress? He doesn't even notice the customer issue that's boiling at the front counter. Jose, I need two more value fries. Sure. Excuse me, I'm, I'm missing a fry here. Thank you. I... Excuse me, I'm missing a fly here. It's certainly acceptable to pitch in briefly when the crew needs a hand. In general, though, it's best to see if there are appropriate crew members who can get involved. In this case, Billy notices a need for restocking and asks a front counter person to help. This allows Billy to keep his focus on QSC and the productivity of his entire crew. So let's talk a little about how to delegate. Why would you delegate? Because it allows you to get more done and helps your crew to feel valued in their job. What to delegate? Typically, you delegate jobs or tasks that you know someone can handle, either because they are experienced or because they have been specifically trained. Of course, you need to use your judgment. 
You should delegate jobs that are appropriate for crew and that do not have a critical outcome. As an example, counting the cash at the end of the evening would not be appropriate for crew. However, inspecting the bathrooms for cleanliness may be. When to delegate. Delegate when you have time to check in with the person and oversee the results of the task. Finally, how to delegate. Your workbook has specific instructions on how to delegate. The key point is to pick a responsible person that you know can handle the job, teach a new process to the person as needed, and verify that everything is done correctly. Delegation without follow-up and recognition is not successful. Make delegated tasks part of your travel path. Take a few minutes to read the why, what, when, and how of delegation included in your workbook. Then answer the questions about delegation on the next page. Continue to think about areas that might be appropriate for you to delegate. Discuss this and the other delegation questions with your coach at the end of this training. Now that we understand leadership styles and delegating, let's continue with the elements of effective communication. The second item to focus on is be here now. Be here now means giving your full attention to a person or group during a conversation. You're not thinking about problems that came up yesterday or the upcoming lunch rush. Instead, you are completely listening to what someone is saying, making eye contact, and if interrupted, excusing yourself and returning to the conversation as quickly as you can. Giving someone your full attention can be very difficult in our environment. Noise, constant activity, and other distractions are all around us. It takes practice to focus on one conversation at a time. A couple of things you can do to help is to schedule important conversations in a quiet location, like the lobby during a slow period or a manager's office and evaluate whether an interruption is critical or can wait until your conversation is finished. While we need to stay focused on our conversations, we don't want to completely tune out restaurant activity and miss important situations. The next element of effective communication is being courteous. This involves greeting people by name, saying please and thank you, and most importantly, using a pleasant tone of voice. Close your eyes for a minute and listen to the tone of my voice. Are you ready? Tina, would you please clean up the lobby? Or, Tina, would you please clean up the lobby? The same words, but clearly two different messages. Remember that our tone gives people the impression that we are being respectful or not. This example shows us that it's not just the words we say, but how we say them that makes us effective communicators. In fact, researchers have found that 55% of our message comes from our body language and facial expressions, 38% comes from the tone of voice we use, and only 7% of meaning comes from what we say. This is an important point to keep in mind. The fourth element in effective communication is to present a clear message. This means speaking clearly and at a volume needed to be understood. As you know, the restaurant can be noisy. If you notice people regularly asking you to repeat yourself, this may be something you need to work on. Also, make sure your message is simple and tailored to the person's experience. For example, we can easily confuse new employees by using lots of acronyms like UHC, HLZ, QSC, and by using McDonald's terms like lot and lobby. I'm sure you can think of a few more. The fifth element for effective communication is to check understanding. One way to make sure you are being clear is to ask the person you're speaking with, what questions do you have? This is an important strategy when you are introducing a new procedure like a McDonald's promotion, or when safety is a concern and you want to make sure the person got the message, or even when talking with new crew who may not be comfortable telling you that they didn't understand. By asking, what questions do you have? you're opening the door for two-way communication. This allows your crew to voice questions and concerns. Do you remember Billy and Jose's conversation about safety gear at the fry station? Billy asked Jose whether he understood which safety gear he was referring to. 
Billy wanted to make sure Jose knew exactly what to do for his own safety. So, what questions do you have? Let's go through a couple of scenarios which should help clarify any key items. Don't forget that your coach is also a great source of information. Turn in your workbook to the communication and action exercise. Use the communication checklist to take notes and evaluate Maria's communication skills. How am I gonna get this MDP done? I told Sandra I'd have it done by afternoon. Hi, Maria. I need your help. Yeah? I can't work this Saturday because I have a wedding to go to. I put in a schedule request, but I'm listed on the schedule from 11 to 7 p.m. Okay, well the schedule can probably be changed. So, what am I supposed to do here? Saturday's only a couple days away. Actually, I'm in the middle of some training that I've been trying to do for a week now. I keep getting interrupted. Sandra is in charge of scheduling. She'll be in here at 3. Just check in with her. Maria, you said you were going to talk to me about cleaning out the freezer. I have to head out soon. Fine, let's do it now. So, what did you think? Maria was pretty rude, wasn't she? We can all feel a little irritable when we're under pressure. The trick is recognizing when that feeling is coming and making a conscious decision to change your outward reaction. Let's compare Maria's actions to the communication checklist. First, leadership styles. This isn't really demonstrated here. Be here now. Maria does not follow this principle, does she? She looks at her MDP and does not make eye contact with Mary. Her body language shows that she is distracted and isn't paying attention to the conversation. Being courteous. <laughs> I'm sure you checked no. Maria's tone of voice and body language were poor. She seemed very annoyed. Presents a clear message? Not really. Maria speaks clearly and loudly, but Mary is new and is not familiar with the scheduling process. Maria does not take the time to give Mary a clear understanding of how to solve her problem. Check for understanding? Maria leaves quickly without checking with Mary or acknowledging the need for follow-up. As a result, Maria probably lost some of Mary's trust. Remember when we talked about the shadow of a leader and crew wants? The top complaint we receive is that the crew feels their managers do not listen to their concerns. The effect of this ripples throughout the crew's work. Let's watch the scene again and see how Maria really handled the situation. How am I going to get this MDP done? I told Sandra I'd be done by afternoon. Hi, Maria. I need your help. Okay. Have a seat. I can't work Saturday because I have a wedding to go to. I put in a schedule request, but I'm still on the schedule from 11 to 7 p.m. Hmm. It must have been a mix-up. Sandra is in charge of scheduling. She'll be in at 3 before your shift ends. Check in with her, and I'm sure she can find you a replacement. Maria, you said you wanted to talk to me about cleaning out the freezer? Mm -hmm. I have to head out soon. Just give me one second, Alex. I'll make a note to check in with you tomorrow. I have to talk to Alex about this freezer issue. It's really important. But I will check in with you in the morning and make sure it's resolved. Thank you so much. I really appreciate your time. So, what did you think this time? Let's look at our checklist. Maria was very engaged in the conversation. She let Mary know she had her full attention by putting down her pen and making eye contact. When interrupted, 
Maria asked Alex to wait while she finished her conversation. I'm guessing you gave Maria high marks on Be Here Now. Was she courteous? I thought so too. She uses a calm and friendly tone even though she was obviously rushed to get things done. Maria was clear about how to solve Mary's problem. Maria didn't check for understanding, but since she was called out urgently, she offered to check in with Mary in the morning. Overall, an excellent example. Mary probably walked away feeling good about the experience and is ready to be productive during her current shift. The sixth and final element of effective communication is give appreciative and constructive feedback. First, let's talk about what feedback is. Giving feedback is when you tell someone how well he or she did and describe specific behaviors the person should continue or change. Feedback is used to motivate crew and manage their performance. Let me show you what I mean. Hi, Ed. What can I get for you today? I'll the number one, a Big Mac and a Coke. Super sized, right? You got it. <laughs> Your total is four forty-seven, please. Okay, there you go. Out of five. Fifty-three cents is your change. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Alex will get that for you in just a second. Okay, thanks. Hi, Ed. How you doing? Good. How you doing? Good. Thanks. Hey, Mary. I like the way you greet the customers. You always make eye contact and greet each person with a smile. Keep up the good work. <laughs> Thanks. Let's look at an example with Maria. Jose, during slow portions of your shift, I've noticed that you've been spending a lot of time talking with others. Like this afternoon when you were talking with Tom at the grill. I know you're still getting to know people on the crew, mm -hmm. but you'd be more productive if while you were having these conversations, you could restock your area or clean your station. Okay, I can do that. Thanks. How to give feedback is something we need to practice. Often we have the right intentions, but do not give the person enough information to continue or change their behavior. When giving feedback, we should always use behavior statements and not personality statements. A behavior statement includes information about actions that you can see or hear. Using our prior example, I like the way you greet our customers. You always make eye contact and greet the person with a smile. Make eye contact and with a smile are behaviors you can observe. If I stopped at, I like the way you greet our customers, the crew wouldn't know specifically what behaviors were effective. Some phrases are commonly used to give feedback, but they don't help the person continue or modify their behavior. These statements are called personality statements. Personality statements let the person know how you felt about their work by describing a personality trait or characteristic but they don't give enough information for the person to know what to continue or change in the future. Some commonly used personality statements are, you did a good job, you're a hard worker, you're lazy, or you have a bad attitude. Let's say your manager told you that you have a bad attitude. How does that make you feel? Probably pretty lousy. This can feel like a personal attack made without any compassion. You might also be frustrated. What does bad attitude mean? Do you know how you need to change? What if instead your manager had said, I'm concerned about whether you're happy in your new position. I don't see you smile often around the customers or crew. And you use a tone of voice that sounds annoyed. You would be more effective if you made a point to smile when speaking with others. And if you changed your tone so the crew felt more comfortable going to you for help or questions. As mentioned earlier, Giving effective feedback is something that takes practice. Let's take a few minutes to do an exercise. Turn to the behavior or personality exercise in your workbook. For each of the statements listed, identify when it is a behavior or personality statement. For each personality statement, underline the word or words that need to change. Let's continue talking when you're finished. Welcome back. Let's look at each of the statements from your behavior versus personality exercise. The first statement says, We cannot have lazy people working in this restaurant. 
Did you mark that as a personality or behavior statement? It's a personality statement. Because the words used do not specifically describe what the person is doing correctly or incorrectly. What word needs to be changed? Lazy. We all have our own vision of what lazy looks like, so this is not a helpful description. An example of a behavior statement might be one we already discussed. When orders are slow, I often see you leaning on the counter and talking with other crew. Instead, you could be restocking supplies or cleaning your station. The second statement says, You follow the procedure for mopping the lobby floor. Personality or behavior? It's a behavior statement. Because the statement describes specific behaviors. Behaviors that we can see when done correctly. The next statement reads, We need more happy people like you. While this might give someone a warm and fuzzy feeling that you like their approach, how does this person know what you mean by happy? Everyone has a different perception of what happy looks like. It's better to use behavior statements such as, you do a nice job of smiling at customers and crew. You use a pleasant tone of voice even when under pressure. Number four reads, to complete the transaction, you need to thank the customer. This is a behavior statement. The crew person would have a very clear picture of what you would like him or her to do differently. Our last statement. You did a good job. How many times have you heard or said that? It's a very common statement. And it's not necessarily a bad one, unless you end the statement there. To change this from a personality to a behavior statement, we need to add more detail. For example, you did a good job keeping the lobby clean. Each time I looked, I saw that the trays were picked up and the high chairs were clean. Using behavior statements takes practice. At the end of this video, you will have an opportunity to practice this further with your coach. Another part of how to give feedback is to assume innocence. Have you ever been upset with someone because you thought he or she had done something to you on purpose only to find out it was an innocent and unintended action? If we assume innocence, that is, we assume a person didn't set out to intentionally harm us or do something wrong, we are likely to respond with compassion or humor. If you don't assume innocence, your emotions and the emotions of others involved can escalate. Let's take a look at an example when our manager, Billy, approaches Alex for being late. Alex, hey, this is the second time this week you've come in 10 minutes late for your shift. Look, I, I don't know if you're mad that we haven't gotten you on another station yet, okay, but we're trying. In the meantime, I'd appreciate it if you took your job seriously and started on time with the rest of us. Actually, my car broke down this weekend. It's been in the shop since Monday. The bus only runs at specific times and I haven't gotten the timing yet. Oh, well, I, well, I didn't. You know, I know Tina takes the bus from the same part of town. Uh, how about if you speak with her today about the best route to take and, uh, and you leave a little earlier to make sure you arrive on time. Yeah, okay. Looks like Billy was a little embarrassed that he jumped to conclusions. Did you also notice how Alex's tone was defensive, reacting to Billy's accusations? Let's see how Billy handled this situation when he assumed innocence. Alex, hey, uh, this is the second time this week you've come in 10 minutes late for your shift. Now, it's not like you to be late. Uh, is there something going on that I could help you with? Actually, my car broke down this weekend. It's been in the shop since Monday. Uh, the bus only runs at specific times, and I haven't figured out the timing yet. I'm sorry to hear about your car, and I appreciate you making the extra effort to get here. We do need you here on time, though. Um, I know Tina takes the bus from the same part of town. How about if you talk with her today about the best route to take and then leave a little earlier to make sure you arrive on time? Yeah, I didn't know that she took the bus. I'll do that. Great. Thanks, Alex. Hey, uh, good luck with the car. Oh, thanks. Much better. We hope the issue will be resolved by Alex's next shift. And the conclusion was reached without any tension. Remember that assuming innocence is not about whether you think someone is actually guilty or not. Instead, it means that regardless of what we might think about someone's actions, we should always approach the feedback discussion by assuming innocence.
We've talked about how to give feedback, using behavior statements and assuming innocence. Now, let's talk about the two types of feedback we need to give, appreciative feedback and constructive feedback. Sometimes, we only think of feedback as being constructive, intended to correct someone when they need improvement. But a very large part of feedback is letting people know when they are doing things well. We all like to know that our work is valued, don't we? It's very motivating to be praised. Appreciative feedback is saying to someone in a behavior statement that you value what they have done and would like them to continue what they're doing. You can give appreciative feedback at any time, in any place. The important thing is to give the feedback regularly and as quickly after the situation as you can. This ensures that the person remembers what they were doing. It's also very important to give constructive feedback. This can be difficult as a new manager. Often, we don't want to offend someone or hurt his or her feelings. But remember that feedback is important because it helps the person improve their performance. Constructive feedback is giving a specific suggestion using a behavior statement about how to improve. We should give constructive feedback whenever a situation needs to be corrected. If the situation is dangerous, such as Jose cleaning the fry machine without protective gear, we should give the feedback immediately. If the situation compromises QSC, say something immediately but quietly. If more substantial feedback is needed, such as a problem with a crew member who regularly returns late from their break, find a private location where you can speak to the person without concern about their embarrassment. This will make the situation easier for you and much more comfortable for them. Together, you can find an appropriate solution. It's very important to make the distinction between constructive feedback and negative feedback. Negative feedback tells a person that something is wrong, but does not say how to correct it. Like personality statements, the feedback is vague. An example is, Marta, you've got to do better than that. Negative feedback makes people less motivated and should never be used. One final point. Keep in mind that almost as harmful as getting negative feedback is getting none at all. It's human nature. We like to know how we are doing and that our time and effort is being valued. Make a point to find positive items to share with someone at least once every couple of shifts. It lets the person know you're observing and appreciating their work. Let's play a quick game to make sure we're clear about the difference between appreciative, constructive, and negative feedback. I'm going to read and show you a feedback statement. You have to decide, is the statement A, appreciative feedback, B, constructive feedback, or C, negative feedback, which we should never give? Here we go. Thank you, Tim, for volunteering to handle the front counter when Jenny called in sick this afternoon. This is appreciative feedback. It's a very clear message about what Tim did well. Next. Frank, the lobby is still a mess. This is negative feedback, isn't it? It's a very vague statement and doesn't give information about what needs to change. Instead, we could say, Frank, I still see some empty trays sitting on tables and a few spills that were there earlier. Please take care of those right away. This is constructive feedback. Here's the last one. During the rush today, you did a great job of keeping up and correctly filling the orders. That's appreciative feedback. Okay, we're on to our last scenario. There you are. 
You come back soon. Thanks. Hi, Jose. Hi. I know you're fairly new to the fry station. You're doing a great job of keeping at least three orders ready at all times. Thanks. But I also noticed you're over-salting the fries. Now, you'd be more effective if you salted the fries this way. Turn the salt shaker over one time only. Now, that provides our fries with the right taste McDonald's is looking for. Got it. You can go ahead and waste these fries, and on the next batch, we'll do the salting together until you get a feel for it. Sure. Great. Jose, I like the way you're using the salting technique we talked about earlier. Excellent work. Thanks for focusing on this. Thanks, Billy. So, what kind of marks did you give Billy on the communication checklist? Billy did a nice job of giving feedback right as he saw it, didn't he? Because his concern could affect QSC, Billy gave it feedback immediately. Billy gives appreciative feedback when he says, you're doing a nice job of keeping at least three large orders ready at all times. And again later when he says, I like the way you're using the salting technique we talked about earlier. Both statements give a specific description of what he was doing well. In other words, they are behavior statements. That's good. As managers, we need to make sure this is not the only time we give appreciative feedback. That is, when we have something constructive to add. Billy gives constructive feedback when he says, I also noticed that you're oversalting the fries. You'd be more effective if you salted the fries this way. Billy demonstrated the proper technique and then said, this provides our fries with the right taste that McDonald's is looking for. So Billy explained what wasn't working and gave a specific description of what needed to change. This is a good example of constructive feedback. Billy did not use negative feedback, and he spoke in a very pleasant tone of voice, assuming innocence. Overall, a nice job on Billy's part. It's taken some practice, but he is now very comfortable when providing feedback to his crew. I hope you've learned a lot from our time together. It's been a great refresher for me as well. Before we talk about your practice exercises for the communication section, let's review all the items we've discussed. See how much you remember. In the first section, we talked about the fact that people skills are essential for a manager to be successful. We talked about the McDonald's people promise that says, we value you, your growth, and your contribution. Next, we talked about the shadow of a leader and how what you say, and especially what you do as a manager, influences your crew. We talked about the need to gain the trust and respect of your crew, and the strategies for building this trust and respect. Do you remember what the seven strategies are? One, keep commitments. Two, act in others' best interests. Three, be open, but not too personal. Four, demonstrate competence. Five, show confidence. Six, present a professional image. Seven, use respectful communication. We asked you to practice these skills during a few shifts and to meet with your coach. Don't forget to continue using the trust and respect checklist on the job. It's a great reference. We then continued on to the second section of the training where we talked about the elements of effective communication. Let's go through these one more time. One, choose the appropriate leadership style. Two, be here now. Three, be courteous. Four, present a clear message. Five, check for understanding. Six, give appreciative and constructive feedback. Do you remember the two leadership styles? Participative and directive. We also discussed the importance of delegation. 
The last section we focused on was feedback. This wasn't that long ago, so I'm sure you remember. The importance of using behavior statements. Always assume innocence when giving feedback. The need to give appreciative feedback regularly and constructive feedback whenever needed. Remember, no feedback and negative feedback do not help you or your crew. Uncomfortable as it may seem at first, it is critical to learn how to give feedback. This is an important skill for running a productive shift. Phew! <laughs> We've talked about a lot, haven't we? There is one last step in your training that is so important. Remember that the only way to get really comfortable with these skills is to practice them on the job with your crew and to get some input from your coach. Check your workbook for the list of exercises and shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder activities to be finished over the next few shifts. Give the communication checklist a good workout. With some practice, you'll soon feel very confident in your new role and hopefully see even better performance from your crew. I'm heading back to the floor just in time for the lunch rush. Good luck to you as a new shift manager. I know you're going to do a terrific job for your crew and your restaurant.